So just a background to the project, um, for my degree in art here, um, I'm focusing on shopping centres as centres of community and the relationship between shopping and gender was just something that um, came out of that and I found to be very interesting. One of the reasons I found it to be interesting is that shopping really marked the first instances of women moving into urban space and having life more so outside the domestic sphere. So uh, this idea of, you know, when you go into town, you stroll around, you have a coffee and you look at shops and that sort of thing, that kind of came about in the 1800s um, when footpaths were first introduced to towns. So, you know, people, gentlemen could stroll around. But sadly for women, um, they couldn't do this because all of the bars and restaurants and stuff like that that had toilets were solely for men because they had liquor and were possibly brothels and stuff like that. So if you needed to pee, you had to go back home. So it was a bit unfortunate um, in that way. But um, retailers realised this and uh, department store owners created female-only spaces in their department stores um, with little powder rooms and toilets and refreshments. So that really was, in the 1900s, the first time women could kind of get outside the domestic sphere, see other women outside of a nuclear family situation. Of course, this is kind of worrying for a lot of people because the urban spaces were very, very male. And I know a lot of people nowadays say that they are very male orientated as well. Um, so these shops were kind of done up like nice domestic spaces. They had little curtains and cushions and rugs. So it'd be kind of like shopping from the comfort of your own home and you know, women would be well able to do that. But this was seen as extremely liberating from a spatial point of view for women, being able to venture out into these spaces that they haven't ventured out into before. And also this woman, Katie Stanton, who was a prominent American feminist, so for Jet, um, also found this liberating in another way, in a financial sense, that women were now able to control the family budget and uh, by 1915, 90% of spending in the US was controlled by women. At the same time, there was a move towards a non-commercial creation of female space in towns and cities. And this came in the form of Lyceum clubs, which were these clubs for women where they could go in and be educated about cultural matters and chat among themselves in a very you know, polite, well-to-do environment. And these were set in, in amongst you know, department stores and stuff like that in towns. So in a way they were reacting against the consumerist nature of the retail shops, but by being placed there they were kind of enhancing it in a way because people could go shopping and then they could pop into this as well. Another really important thing for women around that time as regards shopping was the creation of an informal kind of collective of women. Many women got jobs in haberdashers and stuff like that and it provided um, sort of an informal forum for giving out um, feminist flyers or leaflets about rallies at lunch times and in uh, lounges amongst your colleagues because there really wasn't much other places where women could hang out with other women. And this is just an image of the suffragettes uh, smashing a shop window, window in um, London and it's kind of just another example of the political and the commercial worlds colliding around this time. To take another really contemporary, not really contemporary, but 1984, um, the Dunn strike um, started off um, when a 21-year-old cashier in Dunn's and Henry Street, Mary Manning, refused to handle oranges from South Africa because she was against the apartheid there at the time. And she went on strike and um, she had strikers pay, it went on for months and months and months and ten other women joined her and one man and they only went off strike when the Irish government banned the import of South African goods until apartheid was lifted in South Africa. And there's a nice plaque to her there on Henry Street and there's also um, a street named after in Johannesburg which is pretty cool I think. Um, <laughs> this is a uh, a really contemporary example of an uh, online community of women um, kind of controlling the retail environment. Um, it's a group in England, mostly England based, um, called Mums Net, and they have quite a lot of power. And they, I think it was last year, yeah, 2010, um, they reacted to the sale of a padded bikini in Primark, pennies over here, for seven year olds. 
and the sun took them up on this and um, the bikini got recalled. So along with this idea of shopping as a leisure activity and something that provided women with a social outlet um, was the idea of shopping as a danger and a task. During the interwar years in Europe and the US, um, obviously a lot of male st store clerks and shopkeepers went off to war, so there was no one really left to serve these women. So that created the invention of silent salesmen, which are things we'd all like take for granted today, like uh, storefront windows, vending machines, glass tabletops, where it was kind of labelling as well, so you wouldn't need a store clerk to show you what you were buying. Also, um, during World War II, especially in the US, a lot of women joined, the, joined careers in industry, while men left for war. But then when the men came back, there was a huge anxiety about how we could get the women back, back into the domestic sphere, because otherwise there would be huge male unemployment, and women also had lower wages, so that was a bit of a worry as well. So to combat this, um, a huge propaganda campaign was created by both the government and really large um, companies in America to recast shopping and recast being a housewife as a professional career, something that before it was every woman was just able to do, they were just born to do that. But now being a housewife was an urgent task, you have to have skills to do it, and one of these skills was shopping. So shopping was no longer seen as a leisure thing, it was, you know, a real, you know, a good housewife knows to buy this brand because, you know, she's looking after her kids and she's smart. But unfortunately, well, I suppose maybe not unfortunately, this kind of backfired for a lot of uh, property developers and shop, shopping centre managers in the 80s because they realised that men were not shopping because you know, it was an extremely feminised activity and they didn't want to be associated with it. So they came up with this idea of market style shopping centres which are like, um, you see there, uh, Georgia Street and uh, Power Escort as well. They don't have domestic boring things like shopping powder or shopping powder, washing powder um, but they have little crafty shops, little vintage record shops so shopping was more of a fun creative pursuit, it wasn't this drudging thing that housewives had to do um, so that really got men more into shopping from the 80s onwards. Men's relationship with shopping has also been cast a lot under the light of evolutionary psychology um, a lot of people explain men's reluctance to shop sometimes in that they're hunters, they go in, they buy the steak and a drill, and then they get out, you know, yeah. <laughs> or whatever they buy. <laughs> and um, whereas women are da, 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 just, you know, flouncing around. Um, of course, many feminists have obviously criticised this as, uh, you know, as a result of marketing rather than an innate human thing. And a very, very extreme example of this view of men's relationship with shopping is uh, the male crash, which uh, opened in a fair few market centres in England and a few shopping centres in England in the early 2000s. And the idea was that you would have like a little comfy room with couches and playstations and maybe football and TV, and women could come into the shopping centre, put their man in there, their husband, their friends, <laughs> their lover of some kind, um, he would stay in there, have a nice time, and then she would pick him up on the way out. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if there's any more, but there were a few in the early 2000s anyway. It's quite funny. <laughs> um, another strand of, of um, perceptions about shopping is the idea of shopping for women as being an empowering, fun, liberating idea. And one, one early example of this was created by Edward Bernays in the late 1920s where he was challenged by a tobacco company to get women smoking because like shopping for men, smoking for women was a really, really male activity and they didn't want to do it. So the idea he came up with was that smoking a cigarette, a cigarette was a symbol of male power and by a woman smoking it she was taking advantage of this and liberating herself and being a modern woman. And, um, this, um, this approach has kind of continued on and it's been very criticised for relating consumerism and feminism as one and the same. And um, there's an early 2000s song by Destiny's Child, Independent Women, about my shoes, I bought them, my car, I bought them, my watch, I bought them. And on one hand, this is 
seen in some feminists to be great. You're taking, like Katie Stanton back in the 1900s, you're taking financial independence for yourself. But other feminists have argued that it's just completely trivial, trivial and consumerist and dis distracting people from bigger social issues. Another area where this has been the link between shopping and consumerism and liberation has been um, criticised is in lifestyle programming, which is mainly directed at women. And from the 90s onwards, there's been a large amount of programmes about what to wear, how to look younger, that sort of thing. And these are heavily criticised by some people because they portray looking better and buying clothes and buying makeup and buying a nice bra as somehow, you know, saving your life and helping you. And they point to the connection between the advertisers between the programmes um, who are advertising, you know, Revlon, L'Oreal and the programmes themselves. And I suppose Sex and the City is probably like the most obvious example of this. That for some people it was uh, a great step forward for feminism in that it showed four women being friends, hanging out. It wasn't really seen before. Um, and then for others, it's just disgusting, all about shoes, etc., etc. And just in a recent Irish Times article, um, just from a few months ago, this worry about shopping being a very trivial, dangerous, kind of dumbing down thing for women to do was discussed in relation to uh, young girls, young Irish girls, maybe 12, 13, 14, listing shopping as their hobby. And you see them around, like Blanche or whatever, just hanging out. And, um, Professor Mary Corcoran, who's a sociology lecturer at NUI Maynooth, says that from one perspective, it's clearly a very superficial form of self-identity to understand or view yourself purely through branding or shopping. But at the same time, you can't be completely dismissive of things that people like to do. So she was arguing that like men going shopping in these market-style shopping centres, it was a form of self-expression and creativity for these girls and they weren't spending huge amounts. They were just, it was really just a place for them to hang out. Another kind of positive aspect of shopping is the idea that emerged in the 1950s about shopping centres as the new village centres. And uh, Victor Grun is an architect who came from Austria over to the US and uh, saw the sprawling suburbs and realised that people, people's village centres and community life have been completely disrupted by this new urban landscape. <coughs> and he invented the shopping mall as kind of a community centre. It would have like, an, like you know, an ILAC, they have a library or an art centre, and you know, a nice place for people to chat. But then eventually he left America because he was just distraught that his vision was completely destroyed by shops taking over. And just another thing, in I a lot of Irish shopping centres still have this community basis. They have um, charities coming in collecting, people packing bags, um, and then just on the community notice boards you do see you know, people buying, selling, and I did notice two very like strongly women's issues notices up in Draha the shopping centre. Um, so recently, um, as part of my project that I was doing, uh, that's still, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Um, I uh, set up a stall in a market and I just asked people's opinions on all aspects of shopping. Um, one of the questions that I asked is, who shops more, men or women, and why? And just a lot of the answers, I'm just going to go through some of the answers we got. Men tend to buy things from a very functional, goal-oriented point of view. When they shop, they're looking for specific things. Women, while also looking for things they need, actually enjoy the process of shopping itself. Men don't. Is it? Yeah. Disgrace. Um, <laughs> women do more shopping for clothes because they want to attract more men. Men buy more alcohol because they can approach easier women. Um, <laughs> this is probably the most moderate one. Men tend to shop because they need to for practical reasons. Um, men don't go shopping just to look around, whereas women are more likely to enjoy shopping. For men it's more of a task. Not for all men, but for most, I think. And um, they just kind of pointed out the whole, that the evolutionary psychology view of shopping it's still very much at the forefront of people's minds. And um, yeah, that's the end of the lecture. And if you have any questions or opinions, that would be cool. And thanks for coming. <laughs>
trying to find a community away from the city shopping centres or spaces trying to set up like a place for people to come together that you know isn't all the retail. Um well I think you probably answered your own question yeah. like <laughs> I, I like I would see that there is, but I mean I was talking to the manager of uh, pavilions and swords and I asked him about like how the recession was affecting things and he said that it didn't really affect the numbers of people going to shopping centres. You know, people would go and they would still have their coffee, but they might not buy anything. So people still use them, even though they don't have much money as before, as you know, you just go out on a Saturday, it's a place to go Beautiful. if it's raining like so I think they they're still extremely popular like that's true, because I asked Colin, I asked everybody for the income, just to do a talk on Saturday, just for the crack, you know, walk around the shops. I don't even have any money, so there's no point, so they wouldn't even want to buy it, and we said, no, no, I don't want to spend my day off shopping, so that's fair enough, we do something else. And then his cousin texts and said, do you want to come to Belfast with me? And because there's another boy going, he says, well, I know Niall's got, not going to go around and pick up million things, try them on and not buy anything. <laughs> he says, I know that like, I'd be able to talk and go to the pub like, if you want to go shopping. So like, it's totally true. <laughs> it's shopping. And I just go and just look around and don't buy anything. It's just sort of something to do. It's social. It's nice to get out of the house. But, yeah. but when you say social, do you meet other people? When you yeah, I always see people out. And just to see other people, not even that I, I don't know, just like to come away from the country because I live in the country. I like just go into town and have a walk around and see people and go for coffee and people watch, I suppose. Yeah. It's relaxing for me. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people said that. I know uh, my friend is over, you know, Ballymore, kind of near Charleston Shopping Centre, and he's on these new estates, and there's like no one living beside him. So we just said, like, the only place to see people is up the shopping centre because he has no neighbours, basically. So yeah. <laughs> they're kind of like. Same as going to town, really. Do you think the idea of window shopping is there like an ability to maybe appreciate these consumer items as articles of maybe fetish or either just something to admire aesthetically pleasing? Like if you're going around walking through shops, are you just looking at things because they're nice? I, they're nice. Nice. I think so. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I more so enjoy shopping if I'm just to have nothing to buy. Yeah. yeah. And like, would there be a divide there between then? women, like men and women there, or like a gender divide in that yeah, aspect of things? Yeah, it probably is, like I suppose, because fashion and stuff is more, you know, associated with women. That's probably an interesting point, like if there were more male things on display, maybe men would be more into shopping, I suppose. Mm. I think it's a good, good I'm not generally much into shopping at all, it's sort of for, like, I suppose, um, a combination of ideological reasons to do with capitalism and mm. environment, I would be very sort of down on the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I had this experience um, just after my daughter was born that sort of made me realise kind of that these were genuine kind of public social spaces. And um, uh, um, like Three days, uh, three days after she was born, my milk came in. So sorry, this is going to get <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, So like, I suddenly went up like four sizes, you know. Mm. Like, and I needed to get a maternity bra. Like, and you know, I was still kind of like, oh my god, just a baby. Like, what's mm. going on? You know? <coughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I had her with me, and we went into Marks and Spencers because that's where you go, I suppose. And then. Uh, as I was kind of like nosing around there, I mean, I was really, you know, I was really tired and obviously very kind of emotional and stuff, but like a couple of days after you give birth, as well as your milk coming in, you kind of, it's quite often that you just cry, you know, it's like baby blues, just like you get a big wave of crying, and it starts there, you know, the time just sort of in the lingerie, kind of went like, wow, <laughs> like, yeah, obviously very tiny baby, really. <laughs> And it was sort of amazing what happened because, like, the women who, you know, it was all, there were no men there, really, you know, but, um, like, 
the staff, who were women, were like, this was the moment they had been trained for, you know, and like, or <laughs> someone from here and there, and like, I was going to, and like, the women who were shopping around me were like, you know, like, one came up to me, and she said, I'm here with my daughter, and she's 14 now, and we're buying her her first bra, <laughs> 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 and token, and I was like, oh, <laughs> 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 I mean, it was sort of like what you'd think you'd get, like, in a harem, or, you know what I mean? Like, like sort of women being together, but, like, that's where it happened, you know? No, when I went home, I was like... At least that was straight, you know, I could sort of think this is something that has always happened since there were people, and this is the context, this is the space that it happens in today.